Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the workshop. Fantastic to have you here. We're working on our gigantic one meter, one centimeter long bladed Scottish Claymore sword. Yesterday I forged out the guard after doing some grinding on the blade. Right now I'm gonna do some grinding on the guard and then we're gonna go back to grinding on the blade, but most of all, <laughs> drop something. Most of all, thank you very much for being here. It's gonna be a lot of fun working through the day and bringing you along for the journey, thank you. Lots of people have asked me why it is that I often put on a uh, pair of nitrile gloves underneath these gloves I use when I'm grinding. And the reason for it is as follows. When I'm grinding, I need to make sure that, especially if the blade has been hardened, I'm keeping it cool. So I'm frequently putting my hands in the water, taking a can and pouring the water over the blade. This naturally means that the blade gets wet and my hands will get wet. And if you start working with wet hands, then your skin softens up and it's just no good because you then take your gloves off and then you go back to doing normal things and your hands then dry up and crack, which is miserable. You know, this is one of the things about working with your hands. You've got to take care of them because if the skin isn't in, uh, in tip-top condition, then you can't work because you've got to use your hands all day. And if it hurts to use your hands because you've got cracks all over them because they dried out too fast, part of that for me is making sure to take care that I don't keep my hands in the wet for too long, which I think is pretty sage advice. Of course, you've got to be careful when you're using gloves and spinning machinery. I'd never use gloves on a mill or on a lathe. Here at the grinder, the pinch points are relatively few and far between. It's dangerous to use gloves because stuff can get pinched and dragged in. So you've got to be really, really careful of that and evaluate the cost benefit yourself. For me personally, however, whenever I'm doing grinding like this, the cost benefit tends to work out in favor of some nice, tight, grippy gloves like this, which I think for the machinery that I'm using is relatively appropriate and saves me grinding on my fingers too much. Here we go. So I've cooled off the top of this and I'm now flattening down the back side so that it's gonna require a lot less finishing to get a really nice fit up with everything. Make sure it's straight. Ugly dugly. So while that cools, I'm going to take our blade, which is currently at a 60 grit, and we're now going to go to 120 grit. Now we're going to do that on the flat platen, and that's just going to be a straight grind from there. However, before we advance up to 240 grit, what I'm going to do is I'm going to flip that platen around. That's going to give me access to the slack belt, and I'm going to be able to concave the edge to get the edge down to the final thickness. And at that 120 grit belt, that's going to be the final bit of stock removal, so to speak, uh, of heavy material removal to then take what is right now like a 20 thousandths of an inch edge across the whole thing. No. Yeah, take what is now about a 20 thousandths edge across the whole thing, and then from that 120, uh, bring that down to obviously a much thinner edge with that very slight apple seed. <laughs>
Locally. So here is what is happening. Let me update you. This blade here has a trizact finish off of the belt. This is going to require a lot of hand sanding. It also has a slight convexity to it, which is good. That helps support the edge a little better when it comes to having an actual edge and, you know, needing to battle against the English. Scottish Claymore. The guard, I have indeed stuck with the guard that we started on in yesterday's video. After a little grinding, I'm pretty pleased with how this is turning out. I ended up having a little bit of a shorter protrusion than I initially thought, and I think this is going to work nicer proportionally with the shape of the guard with the shape of the blade, so I'm quite happy with that. Up here is a little thick, it's a little roughed out, and the reason for it is, is I want it to be thick because I need a little leeway because what I've got to do next is going to be pretty difficult. This blade, of course, has to go onto the guard, or the guard has to go onto the blade, which means that that blade, the back of the blade here, needs to sink down into the bottom of the guard. That is going to require that we have a cut out in this protrusion, so that needs to be cut. Ah, not only that, but if we have a look through with our X-ray view, vision. Ooh. Imagining we can see through it, we not only need to cut out through this, but it needs to create a pocket halfway down the guard that is flat with the bottom of the guard for that tang to sit into nice and firmly. And then, of course, it needs to be milled to be able to accept the tang's complete passage through the guard right there. Ah, yes, this is where the laws of physics begin to make this whole project a little bit more difficult. So, this is going to require me using the mill and a carbide end mill. Now the issue is an end mill is a rather small in diameter in this particular instance piece of steel that needs to be spinning at an extremely high rate and somehow needs to go all the way to the bottom here and carve a groove. That means that while this is spinning at an extremely high rate, oh yeah, wait, it's not going to spin at an extremely high rate because it's not long enough. Now there is a reason most end mills are standard, they're about that size. And there is a reason that it was extremely difficult to get a hold of this one. It's because most people aren't silly enough to think they need a 55 millimeter, four millimeter diameter end mill. And that's because of the laws of physics and mostly just common sense, which is about all I'm knowledgeable with from time to time. Um, yes, four millimeters, 55 millimeters away. This is going to flex a lot as it's taking a cut and it has a very high risk of snapping. Now, I used to have two of these end mills, so I would have had a little bit more of a leeway. I could snap one and then maybe use the other one. Um, but there is a reason that I only have one one of these end mills now, draw your own conclusions as to what happened to the first. Ugly ugly. so we've got a lot of milling to do on this, and part of milling means you have to have everything secure so you don't break things, especially when you have to poke your milling cutter so far out of the collet that it might as well not even be in it, as that is what we've got to do today. So I've got now two uh, vaguely flat sides that's going to allow me to get a decent clamp, I hope. This is going to go in the vise, so I need it flat across the bottom, so I'm going to lay some parallels down, and I've got some steel plates either side that are a little softer than the jaws, because then hopefully when I clamp on this, those steel plates are going to have a little more give than the hardened jaws because the sides aren't perfectly flat on the guard because I did it on a grinder, you know. That give should help us get the clamp that we need. I'm going to make sure this is flat. This is not the most accurate way to get anything clamped straight, vertical, parallel, what have you. But so long as we work only from the top down, which is in the realm of possibility that I could do it, it should be fine and we should actually have something even that we can then work everything else off from. Welcome to Alex Steele's How to Make a Parallelogram but Guard. Oh boy.
Okay, so, so far, starting at the very top with another four millimeter cutter up much closer, I worked my way down, and then every so often I drop the cutter down and I go a little further. I then found the width of the blade and then plunge down. You can see this is because that cutter is so far out of there, the vibrations mean that we have a very uneven and very unaccurate cut the whole way down, but we do have a flat bottom, which is fantastic, and it means that we can start thinking about the next step, which is, of course, the hole that's going to go the whole way through and accept the tang. This could be tricky because it requires that I go all the way through from the top side without hitting this and I don't know if I have enough cutter. I might have to drill it and file the whole thing open. Well, I'm stuck. Uh, there is an issue, which is the longest bit that I have is a four millimeter bit, but I need to go a little wider for it to fit on. So I'm stuck because I don't know a, how I'm going to get the hole that goes the whole way through, and B, how it is that I'm going to get it wide enough. So, I need a fresh brain. I'm going to do something else, which is, Jamie's already started on it. I'm going to set up a squat rack. with the magic of time lapsing. You, you didn't see the amount of times that I messed up putting things on backwards because I decided that it's smart to, uh, to not look at an instruction manual. But over the past couple of months, I have been really enjoying myself lifting weights and going to the gym and lifting weights and it's super fun squatting and, and deadlifting and doing these fun things and it's enjoyable having the strength in the workshop that comes as a result of that. And so I thought, you know what's a good idea, Alec? Put a frickin' squat rack in your workshop. Yeah, that's right, and that's what I did. <laughs> I've got my US flag in front of the squat rack. I've got the bar. I've got some weights, and uh, yeah, no, it's uh, time to get strong. Thank you for watching the episode. I'm going to see you guys on the next episode as we continue working on the Scottish Claymore. Lots of work to do. It's going to be exciting working some more on the guard. For now, I'm going to lift some weights, and that's always so much fun.